Okay. All right, we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, this is Aaron Murakami uh, calling from Spokane, Washington. It's July 13th, uh, 12 o'clock Pacific Daylight Savings Time. And we're, we have uh, Eric Dollard and uh, company. We got Haka says, Griffin Brock, Justin Miller, um, Connor Fisher, who's been helping out at uh, EPD Labs. And then I think later, um, Ad Dr. Adrian Marsh is going to be joining us. Um, I'm just going to go over a few announcements. And then um, Haka says, who should I start with first after I do some announcements? Do you I have think, the sequence? I think I'll run the intro and then we'll pass it off to everyone as we go. Okay, sounds good. Okay, so let's see here. Okay, so a couple of announcements here. I'm just going to do a screen share and I'm going to go through uh, go through a couple of things. So first of all, right now on um, emediapress.com, there's a 30% discount off of all um, digital downloads. Um, once you're in a shopping cart and you're checking out, you can enter hot July special. Um, that's good until July 20th, which I think is next Saturday. Yeah, about midnight uh, next Saturday. And um, it's uh, only for digital products, no, no physical products. And so hot July special is the coupon code. Um, I don't think it's case sensitive. And so once you're ready to check out of the shopping cart with any um, books or videos, uh, the digital downloadable ones, that'll automatically take 30% off the entire purchase. Um, then I have a couple announcements here. Um, <clears throat> there'll be a couple extra uh, images added to this for a preview. Um, this is a presentation that was done at the 2022 Energy Science and Technology Conference uh, at my shop at, here in Spokane, Washington. This would have been in July of 2022, and it was never released. Um, I just found this recently. Uh, one of the problems that we had with it was that when we had um, uh, rendered this, uh, there was some noise problems with the transmitter, I think, that... Uh, Haka says was operating, and while Griffin, a couple sections during the presentation, Griffin was explaining something. It was real kind of muffled with the sound, so Simon did put the audio through a filter to kind of clean that up a little bit to make it a little easier to hear. Uh, 90, 95 percent of the, the the presentation is perfect audio, so it's just a few little sections um, that it was kind of. Uh, no, they had some noise interference, but that's cleaned up pretty good. So that is uh, available on the website right now. It's only $17. Um, if you do use that coupon code for the um, discount, you'll get 30% off of that. So anyway, the the uh, cosmic light bulb, what this basically was, was kind of the cosmic induction generator, uh, a presentation with the, the so-called cosmic induction generator, which are the two uh balanced coils where we're doing different plasma uh, tube experiments in between uh, the coils. And there's maybe, I don't know, six or seven different tubes that that Griffin is doing most of the experiments while Haka says is is operating the transmitter. So it's really interesting. There's some different, you know, formations and different types of colors that are showing in these bulbs that don't really correspond to you know, with the vacuum being in there, there's not really supposed to be any gases in there yet. We have these interesting illuminations. Um, so anyway, that's it's, it's a little over about two hours long. That's available. Um, next thing is, is on these, uh, this is on emediapress.com. This is the uh, uh, Bedini sideband generator. There's only 15 left. Um, I have redone the circuit board so that all the little tuning pots inside are... Um, easier to deal with uh, when we when we assemble these. It's not anything that the end user is going to even notice. This is mostly just for us. But in any case, it's going to be a few months before I can get another batch of these done. So once this 15 units runs out, uh, there's not going to be any more for a little while. Um, I also want to mention that there is, uh, this is a new uh, video. We did this about maybe, I don't know, a week and a half ago or something. This was done, okay, June 28th. This is a video presentation, which was um, not really a presentation. It's more of a dialogue between Eric, Eric Dollard and Peter Lindemann. Uh, this predates the Borderland days going back to Santa Barbara and how they met. 
uh, the different projects they were working on and kind of a cast of characters of who they were involved with, you know, Chris Carson and David Franklin and, and some of these other people. And it's real, real uh, interesting uh, conversation going on here. Um, we're, we have a couple more planned, uh, but I think the, the next couple are probably going to be Eric and Peter giving commentary on some of these old videos. Like for example, some of the old borderland videos, there's some of these longitudinal transverse wave videos. There's, uh, a few others. There's, uh, one of these old, um, ground transmission type videos. And then there's one which is called free energy research, where I think that one is a couple hours long and it goes from one, one experiment to the ne next, to the next, to the next. And a lot of people over the years have had a lot of questions about these. And so in some of the next videos recorded like this with Eric and Peter, what I'm going to do is I'm going to play a little excerpt from each one of those experiments and just have Eric and uh, Peter um, just kind of give an explanation of kind of what's going on there. And that'll kind of be the Ebert and Siskel of <laughs> some of these uh, videos where um, Eric and uh, Peter can kind of explain a little bit more of the background behind what, what's being shown in those videos. Uh, let's see the next thing on vril.io, V-R-I-L.io is um, the wet, the official website for the Lakovsky multi-wave oscillator that we manufacture. Um, right now we only have about four, or so units on hand, ready to ship within 24 to 72 hours. Um, these, most of them are available with the ring antennas. Um, we can provide uh, the PCB antennas um, for the uh, le less expensive uh, option. Uh, once these are gone, it's gonna be several months before we have another batch of about 20 of them. Uh, let's see right here, um, EPD Laboratories Inc. is a 501c3 nonprofit corporation. Uh, registered in Nevada. Uh, the organization operates out of Tonopah, Nevada. And recently, um, Haka says and Justin and Connor were down there helping Eric with some different experiments and um, just get, get some business done down there. And here in a few minutes, Haka says is going to be going through some uh, videos and some slideshows so you can see some of the progress in the experiments. And we'll get some comments from from everybody. Um, Griffin wasn't at this particular meeting, but he was there recently um, doing some other stuff with Eric. So I'm not sure if he has a slideshow or not, but he'll he'll let us know. And then I think uh, Justin has some stuff to share. And then Eric will have some comments and Connor may or may not uh, have some comments to, uh, to add to what Haka says is gonna be showing. Um, and I see that uh, Adrian Marsh is joining us, um, and he may want to he may want to pitch in. But on uh, EricPDollar.com forward slash donate, this is where you can donate to help support EPD Laboratories Inc. And I want to give a special thanks to um, Coyote. Uh, she has uh, donated a couple sizable uh, checks over the last several years to help uh, EPD Labs out, and recently. There's a very timely donation, um, which has helped uh, make life easier for the organization. And uh, Eric has a, a letter for you, which I'll, if you happen to be watching this, which I'll scan in and I'll, I'll email that to you. Uh, but on this page, most people donate by PayPal. Uh, you can click on the donate link here and you can donate one time or you can make a recurring payment. You can either donate by by Bitcoin. Um, and then if you want to send a check or, check or money order, uh, you can send it to this Spokane address right here, and I just endorse those checks and send the, send those down to the bank in uh, Tonopah, and that basically, you know, is kind of kind of the the uh, the heartbeat of the organization is these donations because that's what makes it happen. And what you're going to see with some of these um, slideshows that uh, everybody's going to be uh, sharing on this call with you, you can see that the funds are absolutely going to what they're intended for, and that's to further the research in the electrical sciences here. Um, let's see, I'm not sure if I have any more uh, announcements. I think that's about it for right now. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and mute myself out, stop the screen share here, and then I'm gonna enable screen sharing for you, uh, Haka says. 
Okay, so uh, yeah, Aaron, thanks for the intro. This was the EPD 2024 uh, summer episode. Uh, participating, uh, Eric, obviously, but uh, it was myself, uh, Justin Miller, and uh, Connor all visiting the uh, EPD lab for a certain string of time in order to progress a few of the major experiments and uh, projects that have been going on here. The, I'm glad to say that uh, with the donations and everything everybody's been helping, we're finally uh, getting to a point where we hit some good milestones this trip, and uh, we're coming very close to some to some actual completion dates for some of these projects. So uh, what we had going on uh, for here is uh, there is three main uh, goals of this episode. One of them was to operate at the seismic mine to get the power line uh, power system up and uh, near completion to the point where the power company can hook up and we can eventually have the seismic mine uh, recommissioned and uh, eventually put back online and on the internet. So the seismic signals that were uh, that were decommissioned by the university some years back is back online for real. Uh, a next thing that we had working on was the Telurk platform, which was transmitting uh, transmitting signals through the earth uh, in order to test propagation uh, via the Tesla mode and not a conventional radio. We had uh, uh, we were able to double the power that time, and we'll have some more uh, results. We'll go into details with that. And then the last big one was the uh, Alexanderson antenna, which has uh, finally reached a state of completion that we were able to start getting signals out of it. So uh, Griffin, unfortunately, couldn't make it. There's other uh, other technicalities, but uh, we did get a lot. He was helping a lot on the sidelines, providing background support. But uh, I think since going fairly in order uh, with uh, what we were working on there, I think if Connor, you want to talk a little bit about some of the uh, stuff we were, some of the stuff that was over at the seismic mine and the operation systems that we had going. Sure, I can speak to that. Actually, I could run, have... the, I could run the slides if you want to do that too. Sure. Yeah, but they're very small hypothesis. Can we have them larger on the screen? Let me see if I can do a full screen. If it was a full screen, we could see the pictures then clearly. Let's... There you go. We're going to have to do small screen for the uh, video feed, but for the slideshow, I think this will work. Okay. So yeah, what you can see in that image is the uh, conductors being run to the feasible. disconnect switch and meter right outside of the seismograph station. So uh, what we're doing is we're just getting the infrastructure put in so that we can have a power company establish a permanent power connection uh, for the seismic transducers. That way we're getting constant data sets out of that. Um, so yeah, you can see that right there. We're just running conductors, getting that prepared. You know, we're we're basically at the point now where the power company could establish a connection to the mine, uh, the mine being where the seismic transducers are located. Um, so we've gotten a lot of preliminary steps out of the way. Yeah, you can see, you know, our signage is in place. We're, we're all ready for the power company. You know, at this point, we've just uh, been running on temporary power for short periods of time. Um, okay, here you can see Justin securing the telephone line associated with the seismograph station. So, you know, just showing off some of the line work. Now, Justin. Now is, is everybody able to see the pictures at the same time while, while you're talking? I think it's lined up. It is? Okay. Yeah, I'm seeing it on my end. Okay. Okay. Uh, let's see. Yeah, that's just a, a visual of the seismometers themselves, the seismic transducers um, inside of the mine. Uh, I had one one little thing is uh, one of the goals that I had was a brief interlude. Uh, there's a short video of uh, taking some measurements of the geophone so that we can eventually uh, hook up the proper receiving equipment and amplifiers to get the signals out of it, uh, possibly on the next episode. Yeah. That video is on your YouTube channel, correct? Yeah, uh, we'll have Aaron post a link on that. Okay. 
Yep. One and of one is... of the difficulties with uh, with operating in the desert is uh, drilling ground rods and other other necessities. And one of the problems that's often encountered when drilling through the desert is encountering rocks and other other obstructions and problems. Yeah, de definitely a complication. Everything out there is just mine tailings and rock. So it doesn't always come through in the pictures of how grueling, uh, sunny and hot and dry and just general uh, general hazard there are there is just working out there all day. But worth mentioning. Yeah, now the conditions are uh, especially in the summer months. Uh, the desert is unforgiving. <laughs> so yep. Um, that was just showing getting set up for a ground rod previously, getting installed. Here I am uh, running conductor again for the meter socket, you know. That was, uh... Just showing all the preliminary stages. And uh, right there, you can see some of the equipment. Sorry. Yeah, it's all good. Um, Sorry, God. This... Yeah, you know, this is some of the equipment associated with the uh, seismometers that was basically donated so to speak, by University of Nevada. Um, I think what this doesn't show is that Eric's actually been working on a novel amplifier circuit, which is unlike anything else. And I believe he's going to be using that in conjunction with the uh, seismograph station, if I'm correct. But can't really speak to that. But, you, yep. And uh, it's just oh. Justin set up and the dog out in the desert. Out in the hot Tonopah desert. And again, more of uh, Justin securing that telephone line right there. So uh, you can see the backdrop of the town of Tonopah. I think that's most of what we had for that. Yeah, you know, there, there wasn't much that needed to be done there. Um, but like I said, we're, we're at the point now where we just need the necessary funding to make those permanent power connections so that we can get those data sets out of the mine at a, a you know, consistent rate. So I guess the next step is uh, getting power to the mine, uh, getting the reception, uh, the amplifier and preamplifier equipment online and getting the signals that are generated out of that site and off to, you know, off to the internet where it can be, you know, permanently recorded and displayed and graphed and analyzed. Yep. So that's about all I got as far as uh, giving updates. Okay. Uh, I guess I'll pick up the the next one on here was the work on the Telerik platform. So uh, the last couple episodes, uh, it's a follow up on the last couple episodes. The first trip, uh, two episodes ago, we had uh, finally uh, finished this platform. Essentially, it's a it's a Tesla coil that sits on a particular on a very large ground plane. And it's configured in such a way that it's not designed to transmit through the air, but through the earth. Uh, it operates on the 160 meter ham band around two megacycles, which uh, as anyone that's a ham would know is a very low frequency that generally requires very, very large antennas in order to operate. Uh, it's, a, it's very rare to see hams actually use it because it's usually farmers with four or 500 foot antennas uh, that are the only ones that are able to do this. Uh, the first episode was uh, uh, it finally came to a completion at a pretty late in the game. So we were able, only able to do a test to about 15 miles. And we were able to get to 15 miles on, uh, it was far less than five watts. It was actually approximately, it was like five watts detuned with an SWR of like six to one. So it was less than one watt of power. We were getting 15 miles. Uh, the last episode, which was the uh, fall of 2023, uh, we were able to get to, uh, we were able to up the power to about 80 to 100 watts. And with the 100 watt transmission, we were able to reach 120, 110, 120 miles to uh, Keeler uh, with uh, less than five watts of transmitted power at night. And uh, hadn't well, we hadn't done any daytime transmissions. So this episode was uh, taking it the next step further, which was going from 100 watts to 200 watts and uh, making transmissions throughout the day to see uh, how that operated. Uh, first step, the first part of it was simply uh, plugging everything back in, hooking it all back up, and making sure the uh, the characteristics were the same as last time. Uh, basically, a sanity check from our previous test to make sure nothing significant had changed. You know, the ground was still good. 
the coil was still performing as expected and everything was still in the range that we were expecting. And that was good. So I didn't take a whole lot of measurements on that because uh, Griffin had done a better job of that last time. There's a couple of the connections with the SDR uh, doing a vector network analysis, just verifying some of the parameters. Uh, this setup, uh, we're using a, a ferrite matching transformer rather than a, an air, a, a two or three turn primary. Uh, same, uh, same thing, we'll have some more uh, detailed notes on the previous episodes. Uh, let me zoom here a little bit. You can see the coil. Uh, this is the Tesla extra coil that's designed to be the transducer that's actually uh, helping to pump energy into the ground rather than into the air. This was the transmitting setup that we had. On the very bottom is an ICOM 746. It's with about a 100 watt rating. Uh, above that is a Meritron uh, tube amplifier that's rated to about four, 400 watts, but we were only pushing it to about 200 due to the, the weather and uh, sunny conditions and uh, long-term transmit. Uh, and on the top is a uh, uh, antenna tuner. Uh, what was different about this trip is in addition to the, um, in addition to the higher power rating, we were also able to add a, sorry, I gotta skip around here a little bit. Do I not have it? Uh, we we're also able, able to add a, uh, a mercury wetted relay based uh, Arduino powered uh, beacon transmitter that was hooked to the rig in order to uh, allow us to do long-term testing without having to continuously key the transmitter, you know, say test, 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 or manually key with the thing uh, all day. So when uh, when this test was performed on a on a Sunday, we began about uh, 3 p.m. Uh, there were two two main sections of it. One was doing the uh, distance reception at about 110, 120 miles away. Uh, the other part was Eric and uh, Justin driving off in the car to uh, try to get uh, to see how far the signal propagated during the day. Uh, because normally the 160 meter band, the conditions are very bad. You're not, you don't expect to get anything out of that. Uh, and I'm going to have to pop off the screen sharing to get this to work. But so to play the video, uh, this is this is the actual video with the uh, beacon transmitter running, and we, have, we essentially had this running all day. Uh, uh, doing the various tests throughout the day and at various locations. So as this was happening, uh, stand by one second. Okay, as that was going, uh, Eric and Justin were going off in the car to see how far this was propagating during the day. Uh, the trans the uh, transmitter, if you want to call it an antenna, even though it's not an antenna, is about 10 feet when the normal should be several hundred. The receiving antenna, as you can see on here, is the uh, parallel whips of, I think, about 10 foot uh, with no tuner so and no ground. So it's uh, essentially the worst conditions that you can expect. And in normal conditions, 160 meter band, you would not get anything during the, during the day. But uh, traveling out, I have uh, one of their reports that was approximately 35 miles. I will play, try to play right about here. Here we are in Eric's car. This is the radio in Eric's car. Receiving now approximately 30 miles away from about 35, Eric says about 35 miles away from town where this is being transmitted from. This signal is being transmitted from the telluric apparatus that we showed. 35 miles away, and this is being received on this PRC 47 out of the eight foot whip antenna on the hood of Eric's car. You can see it there outside the vehicle. That's an eight foot standard CB antenna. It's not tuned for this purpose. So you have that. I was able to get uh, 35 miles crystal clear during the day. I believe it was about uh, 3 p.m. local. And then uh, the other test that they have reported was at approximately 50 miles, which I will play now. 
Here we are, 52 miles, mile marker 52. We're going to consider this our minimum discernible signal for this setup. Uh, for some reason, it's interesting. We can't hear the uh, we can't hear the Morse code the setup that you saw back at the lab. There's no audio with this. Well, there is. Yeah, no, that, that actually was on the video that. Uh... Fifty-two miles minimum to serve this again. So hope that came through okay. Uh, that's what we had for uh, that reception. I'm sure uh, Eric, uh, Justin, anyone has anything to uh, to chime in? Well, we don't seem to be able to hear the signal. Uh, let me... Morse code signal wasn't coming through in the in the video, but uh, or you know across the Zoom call at any rate. But we all um, know because we've shared that video within the group that you can hear the Morse code. Uh, you know, CW call sign. Uh, 35 mile. Let me play this one more time. There was a, there's a noise suppression feature I disabled. I'm going to try this uh, one more. Hopefully this works. Sorry. No, it's still, it's still silent. Digital. <laughs> it doesn't like it. It doesn't like it. that. But that's okay. I mean, for everybody who's on the call, who's, you know, uh, participating here, I'll just explain that you can very clearly hear the, the Morris code for some reason, some, some digital, well, digital, uh, that's the way digital works. Is very <laughs> fight sheet. Some fight program that's yeah. trying to noise reduce and, and thinks that that's a background noise that, that, that we don't want. But at any rate, it's there. Uh, but yeah, that's pretty much all I had for that. Uh, if we want to keep going on, the uh, the, the main, uh, or I'll say the next part of the episode was the uh, Alex Anderson array. And I think, uh, Justin, you might be the more suited for uh, talking about this since you have uh, maybe starting with some of the history of how this all came together. Because sure. I know there's That's many great, years yeah. behind this whole this whole episode here. If, you, uh, if you'd like to run the slideshow, that'd be great. So what you see in here in the photograph, this is the beginning of this episode. Justin, can we have the hack assist? Can we have the pictures oh, large again, please? Because they're very small. And Thank you. done. Thank you. Perfect. Thank okay. you, Justin. So, yeah, you bet. Uh, so this is the beginning of this episode. What you're looking at is the Hilltop Shack. I'm sure you know many of the people who are on this call are familiar with this facility at this point since we've demonstrated this in the past. And this is a, an inherited facility uh, along with the seismograph mine that's on our granted right of way. So there's a strange apparatus of pipes in the background of this photograph that we didn't build. That's a, a very crude dish arrangement that the cable TV company built for their for their purpose. This used to this infrastructure, our line, the shack, this hilltop facility was all part of the cable TV right of way. And it's now associated through EPD laboratories with the seismograph facility that was shown, you know, uh, just just recently, Connor and, and Hawk says we're talking about that. So here is uh, the one. You see that pole cross arm right there in the in the foreground. The brace is off of that cross arm. That's the one piece of outside line work that I still have yet to do this session. Otherwise, we got busy in between Hawk says Connor, Eric, and myself. We pretty much knocked out all the outside plant work right away before the heat came in. And uh, now it's hot here and, and we're working on equipment inside the lab at the bench, mercifully. But this is a good representation. You can actually see the, the shaft There's center frame in the background. That shows this is a pretty good uh, representation. Right, right there, there is the shack that's in the previous picture. So it gives you an idea. And this this whole thing is one antenna field. One antenna field, and as you can see, there's no wire on those poles with cross arms. So this is, we have about a 1500 foot section of open wire pole pair currently constructed that terminates at the shack. And then this is proposed for next, sec next session within the course of, of this year. And, and it may, you know, it may be continue, the build may continue into future years, but the, the purpose of all this is to have 
a full scale Alexanderson antenna, uh, at least three pair end to end on the entirety of this structure. This uh, pole that you see here with the double cross arm being the, the other end of this reception structure from the shack. So although there was actually quite a bit of work that Connor did at this point, um, I don't know if we have any more pictures of the grounding network, but there's an extensive amount of grounding, extensive amount of excavation that Connor and Eric have put in uh, um, into into this end of things, um, and with the per, with the intent of extending that line all the way to this point, extending that reception line all the way to this point. So this would be the other terminal end. Okay, we do have a bunch of those ground uh, photographs. So a lot of work has gone into this, as you can see, and uh, as many of you know, this is work that Eric and I started out about ten years ago, and we've you know put a lot of the foundation in prior to this episode. So we were able to really knock a lot of things off the list in a hurry. How many years has this been in works? We received our grant, our right of way grant, our acceptance letter in 2014. I believe it was in March. <laughs> so this is a 10 year project essentially. And how many how many poles are up and how many feet of wire? Like I don't think people realize the may not realize the scope of this project uh, seeing as pretty much all the work is being done with three or four people volunteering a couple times a year. That's right. You know, we, we inherited a damaged facility. When we first got this, there was the cable TV company's coax and messenger cable and various dangling, you know, public hazards that we, uh, that we inherited. And the shack was about ready to blow off the hilltop it, and there was garbage everywhere on this line. So there's an extensive amount of work that went into this. Poles were damaged. We put up, replaced about five poles. I forget. Oh, at least. At least. Yeah. I forget how not only did we have to replace the poles, but we had to go deep out in the desert and harvest them. From... You had to pick the poles out of the ground. In so a lot of it, cases, the yeah. entire structure from the cable TV shack to the terminus in town is approximately three miles. Uh, the antenna structure is 4,800 feet long which is not really long for the frequencies they're dealing with because in ham radio terminology, we are in the 60 kilometer band. In other words, the 60,000 meter band, which uh, is beyond anything you can do with wavelength type antennas. So basically right now we're just starting off with the capacitance antenna. And then when it gets Improved to be an Alexanderson antenna, then the wavelength factors are completely eliminated, and then it will operate at uh, at these lower frequencies, which basically is the voice frequency or ultra low frequency band between 300 and 3,000 cycles per second. Right. So in this frame, we're back up at the hilltop shack, and we've reconfigured. Now uh, we're still we're still adding masts to this structure. We're still improving on what was built previously. Uh, in other previous calls, we've talked about and described the two meter radios that we have in the shack and what their purposes are. So all that stuff was set up by another group of volunteers several years ago, and we've just been steadily improving on what they, you know, what they built for us and making it more robust, making it more appropriate for our installation. So I don't know at what point, oh yes, okay. So here, this is the, uh, the final connection of the line into the shack. Uh, like I said, uh, so much foundational work has gone into this up, and, and to, up to this work episode. And we were able to do some really satisfying things like finally actually bring the signals off the line into the shack this time. And uh, there's more to be done. Next time, next session, we're going to uh, improve and, and change this setup even more. But um, this was a major success. You can see in the rack on the left, the 37 Bravo, which we've discussed as the receiver. It's a noise measuring set for measuring noise on telephone lines. And, and that's exactly what we're doing. We're measuring noise on our open wire line. I think this is the moment that we went up there and actually connected it. So. Um, 10 years in the making, at least. <laughs>
longer than that, that Eric, that Eric and I have been talking about this, that Eric and I have been associated, that I went and worked with him at Lander. So this is getting to the point of where we actually have a representation of what I saw that Eric had built at Lander's is, is back uh, functioning once again. And then I'm going to try this. Uh, this may or may not work due to the NEM issue, but uh, we'll try playing the uh, the actual signal that we're getting off this and uh, cross your fingers. <laughs> So I'll just narrate because we can't really hear the sound, but the you can see the needle move in correspondence with what should be the you know the sound, and it's clicks and pops and noise that's being induced on our line. And a little bit of brief description for uh, for everybody is that what happens is you put a section of wire out in the in space and span across you know some length of poles, and you're going to have you're going to have uh, currents that are induced on that line just from the nature of the fluctuation of the Earth's magnetic fields and lightning and so on. And so the phone company went through great lengths to noise reject. You know, th this piece of equipment was designed to find the noise oh. so they could eliminate it oh. out of the telephone. There we go. Conversation. They want to clear end to end. Can you go full screen? Uh, I'm yeah. full screen on my side. That was good. We can actually hear it. Could hear it for a moment. So basically, digital technology refuses to allow us to use any audio of music or electrical signals or oh. There's just so many variables. It's so easy to make it not work. So basically, we I think we're starting to get an idea that digital is really a non-functional technology that will become more evident as time goes on. Eric, the audio is coming through just fine. I can hear the clicks and the pops. Okay, it's finally coming through. Now, the problem is it's a Rube Goldberg machine. There's so many ways to make it not work. Simple. So those are lightning awesome. strikes you're hearing. This is the wrong time of day for the solar perception. So really, the, these uh, birth signals, as we call them, come in better in, in the evening time. And we did go up, Connor and I, after hunting to the left, and, and observed that they, they do get louder. Uh, nonetheless, this is a pretty good representation of what we're after. Uh, like I was saying, the phone company went to great lengths to build these things so that you had no natural artifacts, no noise. They want a clean end-to-end -end voice communication. And what we're after is the noise. We want to analyze these signals. So, so one thing I want to point out is these signals were not intended to be received at the cable TV shack. They were intended to be received at the facility at the mine, but there is no facility at the mine. So the drawback here is, is the cable TV shack is used as a VHF transceiving site, and those signals are not electromagnetically compatible with signals that we pick up from the Earth's electric field, which are roughly one trillion times weaker than the radio transmitter on VHF. So we're combating that right now. So that's why there's the repeater cabinet down in the gully where it's kind of shielded from all this stuff is we're going to put a input amplifier. So the first 1,000 million units of amplification will occur there. And then the signal will be sent high level to the cable TV shack. There's the repeater cabinet. So, so at any rate, right now, we're about ready to test out our RF filtering and see if we can at least get it to a reasonable level. And uh, I don't know this because there's so many oh, maintenance type things and cleanup and organization that has to be done and with the heat and everything. Probably won't do that with the cabinet this time around. But, um, but at any rate, everything's all set up for that. So next time around, 
we'll put the front end. Basically, we'll use two 37 Bravos in tandem. One will be used for receiving here at the at the front end of the system, and then the other one will be in the shack, where rather than operating at uh, minus 80 dBm, it'll be operating at plus 10 dBm, which is uh, basically one with nine zeros after it difference. So that should uh, make it hard for the VHF to get in because the amplitude will be so great. But nevertheless, the filters and everything will still be up there. So that's what we're kind of hashing out now. And then, then also to be hashed out is the to get the UHF link. It's a uh, UHF or what, what, what's the frequency? 900 and something megacycles or 2.4 gigacycles? This AT and T. Uh, uh, the cell. It's going to be like 2.4 to 5 gigacycle range. Okay. Well, technically, that's still UHF. So, but we still have to get solar panels in for that and batteries because it's a different power system in the VHF transceiving. So. There's still a lot of things that uh, that have to be purchased and what have you to really get this finalized. But um, but at any rate, the progress is pretty good. And my estimate originally was by the end of the year, assuming we get a couple more substantial donations of ten to the fourth dollars or greater, uh, we should have this thing on the air by the end of the year, semi permanently on the internet, set to the. Uh, the ultra low frequency band of 300 to 3000, which filters out most of the lightning strikes and leaves only those signals that are associated with telluric activities, such as those produced by earthquakes and uh, certain weather events. And I'll just also comment on that, that as you can see from what we're describing, what we're showing, what, what Eric is talking about, some of the complications and how we're going to, to build this over time, is that each time that we have a big you know, accomplishment like this, we, we figure out and learn the other things that we're gonna need to do to account for whatever problem that we discovered that we didn't you know, didn't know was there or you know, isn't exactly ideal as Eric was describing. We had wanted to ultimately put the signals at terminated at completely the other end of the facility. And we may still do that in time. We've just started with this because this is the sort of the minimum viable result that we can show proof of concept be able to demonstrate this put this thing back on the air have something that works so that's what we're doing it'll change over time it'll develop over time um and uh i have a couple other ones. i can also slot screen share jeremy or, or, yeah you can do that okay let's see if i can figure out how to navigate that on your Zoom, share screen button about somewhere near the middle. I think it might be in green. So I've now I can't get back to the. You want me to do it? What uh, what things are you looking for? Oh, sorry. Hang on a second. There we go. Let's see if I can get this to cooperate. Um, working on it. While you're doing that, I'd also like to add that uh, one of the advantages of having this on the air and and uh, transmitting is also that it's transmitting, it's uh, recording 24/7, so that it finally gives us the ability to do some research purposes on this on these signals. Is that uh, as soon as there's an earthquake or a seismic event or any any kind of thing anywhere in this immediate vicinity. Uh, we can go back in time after the fact and see how the signals changed, analyze what uh, what what went through, and better understand the the precursors to these events as ter in terms of this antenna system. Is, that's absolutely right. Is it is my screen coming through? Yeah, uh, one hundred live call. So this is actually. I just wanted to give a little history. Uh, historical background of the of the telluric tank yeah everything that pictures we... pictures not coming through it's just uh the folder view right now oh so 
We can see it. We can see it. It's that's max screen on my. Try uh, undo the share screen and do it one more time. Okay, stop share. And share. Is that coming through? It's Mickey kneeling down. There you go. Yes, now you got it. Okay. So just like with everything else that we've described, <clears throat> a lot of foundational work, a lot of background, a lot of history, a lot of time. So this is actually the beginning of the Telluric platform, and there are steel tanks that are outside of the building, which is what we're able, which is what we're using. That's that's the ground that we're using for this experimentation and for uh, receiving long range on low power, which was demonstrated there. Um, and I just wanted to point this out. I was actually back on the coast, not involved with EPD laboratories at the point in time that a lot of this went together. Um, I thought it would let me just cycle through the slideshow, but it's not letting me do that. So I don't know. I'm afraid of clicking buttons. I think I'm just going to let go of trying to do the, the slideshow because we've done such a good job of covering the material thus far, and I don't want to um, slow down the momentum of the call. But that gives you an idea of some of the background. Uh, um, I, I just wanted to show that, that there was quite a bit of work that went into all these facilities that so we're we, using. we can't show any of that? Well, it's it's fighting. I don't want to well, slow it's down. Fighting. It's digital. I don't want to slow down the call. That's the first thing. It's like a bureaucrat. The first word that comes out of its mouth is no. So, oh, there you go. Great. Fantastic. Thank you. So basically, these tanks for all butchered up by the previous owner of the building and poles were cut in them and vents were chopped off and we had to dig all this up and re-weld uh, plates on the openings in the tank and then produce a usable ground electrode and be able to circulate the water inside the tank to keep it clean and also to use it as a thermal inertia device for some kind of heating in the winter. So it has to serve two functions so that's, uh, let's see, we go through the vent's been cut off and a hole has been chopped in the tank and the dirt and mud was allowed to get in. And so that's what we're cleaning up here now. And, and by the way, this was chopped and that problem was caused by the previous owner of this yeah. building. We're, we're in the frames, EPD's fixing that. So that's the collar that the, there's two openings into the tank. The, the previous one, I, I don't know, the slides will probably show them a bit out of order, but here the collar is welded to the tank for a positive electrical connection. And then the zinc covered uh, iron wires, this is a six gauge telegraph wire from the prehistorical railroad days. They have a very heavy coating of zinc on them so the skin effect keeps the signal out of the iron, which would garble it. So we could not weld copper wires to steel, so we had to use this arrangement to uh, to get a low inductance ground. And then switch to something else. Well, this is the the telluric test platform those coming are, together. Those were the original <laughs> coils made by Griffin that were to confirm that it was worth spending the time and money to build these things more solidly with tubing. Hawk says on the bench, this is the first first setup, initial setup. Uh, and this is, it's, it, you know, it's interesting so, sort of the history of this is like, I built that work table probably 10 years ago but when Aka says came and set up, we hadn't yet met each other. So it was a couple of years from this point until Aka says and, and Griffin and Connor and Dr. Marsh and all of us actually got together to, to collaborate on this stuff. I, Griffin and Aka says were collaborating obviously with their earlier. Yeah, I think this is from the original uh, experiments, which was maybe one to two years ago. The preliminary test before everything was mounted on the platform. Preliminary, yeah, before the platform was built, before the. Oh, yep. There's one that Faber cobbled. 
putting some bolts together just to uh, get the transmitter physically set up. This is before the, the actual platform was built. You can see it's kind of uh, metaphorically duct taped together. So really, I just I wanted to show this. Eric wanted to show this just to give uh, everybody, you know, perspective. Again, it's it's it, I think it's very worth noting the amount, sheer amount of labor that's gone into getting us to where we are today, and and clearly we still have a lot more to do. But um, we're feeling very good at this episode about the state of of completion that we've reached. We've gotten some some very satisfying progress. This session as I think everybody can see. And here's the poles after they've been up and you see step by step as it keeps growing and growing. So I think that's probably about good. We're just trying to represent, you know, show everybody this is about two or three years ago that all of this went in, and that's our associate, Mickey, who unfortunately uh, didn't heed any kind of health advice, and he's since passed on. So some some people involved that aren't here, aren't with us anymore. But that's where that was, and that's where it is today. There you go. So kind of the last thing from on my end, as far as the update is, I'm still here working, like Eric mentioned, it's hot. We're working in the shop now. There's a bunch of maintenance details, which are not glamorous, that just need to be done. So I'm going to be focusing on, on those and get a bunch of that stuff knocked out. Um, we are about to, uh, I built the RF, Eric and I, you know, Eric showed me what to strip and we strip equipment, got procured the parts there, designed a circuit, we built it together, built an RF filter to try to keep the two meter radios that are in the shack from interfering with the reception of the 37 Bravo. And that's all on the bench, ready to go back in the, in the shack now. So there'll be more material that we'll document upcoming with that, hopefully uh, rejecting the, the two meter radios and uh, we also have a full, Eric and I have a full documentation that we need to do of the line. We're going to go pole to pole and try and document a bunch of this facility. So there'll be more of that stuff that's upcoming. We're still working on, and that's, that's about it for me. But what about our big cleanup effort? And uh, which, which phase of the cleanup effort are you referring to? What, what you guys were out there doing last week. Oh yeah, well, that's a, that's the part that uh, that isn't any fun is cleaning all of our crap off the power company poles. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, so there was some of that that was shown. You you know, um, is, don't you have any what what we just did? We we do absolutely. Um, we weren't intending to show that. We just mentioned it in terms of securing the okay. the phone line. Um, what you're referring to is. We still have a massive amount of uh, coax that runs. We've cleaned up everything off of our line, what we intend to be our reception line for the Alexanderson Center purpose. But we also have basically inherited the remains of the cable TV company infrastructure throughout town. The cable TV company went belly up and, and evaporated. So that's something that is still ongoing, is, is cleaning up the mess and the hazard a lot of it's on poles, it's secure, we don't have to mess with it for now, it can just hang there. But as we you know, go along and, and legitimize this facility, we, uh, we did spend a couple of days out there pulling down coax, pulling down the messenger and securing the phone line to the mine. So that's what Eric was referring to. And we just, I didn't prepare, we didn't prepare to, to show those photographs during this call, but um, yeah. Again, massive amount of effort. These all take days and days, each each little facet of this this project. See, normally you just get five million dollars and you hire a contractor to do all this and it's done in 10 days. <laughs> normally. That's one way to go about it. And if we had five million dollars, it would be done in 10 days. It's a struggle, you know, that's uh slowly extruded over decades and uh and basically, you know, if you're out there looking at it, it looks like, you know, a scene out of uh, a Sergio Leone spaghetti western of everybody's sweaty and 
dirty and miserable. <laughs> that's what it is. But it's slowly getting forward. And uh, I think that that sort of summarizes it is the three main escapades is the mine is uh, very close to having power and a couple episodes from being completed or, or online to some degree. The Telerk platform is uh, had an extended range test and is getting prepared for uh, to have a beacon station operating 24 seven in the next episode. And then uh, the Alexanderson uh, reception array as has successful signal reception and is also uh, fingers crossed uh, some degree of being uh, online or at least recorded uh, also in the next episode, which is hopefully be uh, later this year. So with that, I think that's all we have. If anyone else wants to add anything. Okay. Um, Griffin, do you have anything you want to gonna share on this call? I'll just give a brief update. So, Presently, since uh, due to other constraints and what have you, I've been focusing on book transcription for Eric. So as Haka says, was explaining his trip to Tonopah recently, he was able to scan a multitude of various documents, notebooks, which I'm presently transcribing into book form. So one of these books, which are which is in the process of finalization, is the third edition of electromagnetic induction and its propagation. Eric could expound upon that further and what it's about. But at the present, that is going to be ready for release very soon. And some other texts, including uh, the second edition of Tesla's polyphase system and other matters will soon to be followed to be released within the next month or two. That's all I have to add. So basically, electromagnetic induction and its propagation, the book is complete. So what I've been doing, because it's so much work and it takes so long to do these things, is uh, when one section is done, then that's released. So there's the first section, which was completed some time back. Then the second section, which... Um, was put out not too long ago, and now the third section is complete. So, so once the third section is released, then the thing is ready to be made into a complete book where the whole thing will be in one binding and not separate, separate uh, subchapters, so to speak. And this is what I'm doing also with the the Tesla stuff. So basically. What I'm in the pro process of doing right now, which is about a two year effort, is the last two presentations I gave, the one on music and the one on polyphase, are in the process of being turned into books. So again, they will be released uh, one element at a time. And then when they're all finally completed, then it will be put into one, one book. So. And then there's some auxiliary stuff like the um, frequency dependent network for the ELF receivers. Um, that doesn't, that's not going to have a lot of text. So Griffin will basically just put out the mathematical process and extractions from the books that gave the instructions of how to proceed with that project. Uh, they're very informative on uh, what Adrian would call the series and parallel modes. They reveal a lot of the arch form of that, or what may also be called transverse and longitudinal. Those terms are somewhat interchangeable. I would like to point out that that effort involved 200 pages of arithmetic. It's the most arithmetic that I've ever had to perform in my entire life uh, to hash all this stuff out. and. Uh, and it's very revealing as to the structure of uh, bandpass filters and various types of transmission structures and what have you. I learned a lot out of it. I don't think anyone's really done anything like this before. So as, uh, as Griffin's availability presents itself, then I think that will come out because it's basically just needs to be converted. There's no writing to be done on that one. <clears throat> And then we'll see where things go from there, because um, I've uh, 
Well, I think I've probably used up about 3,000 pages of graph paper so far in this effort making drawings. So that should be enough to keep Griffin going for maybe the next decade. <laughs> so right now, uh, with, with Griffin, uh, so so where where are we at with the Marconi uh, electrostatic aerial and, and what are we planning to do with it? So the next step forward is placing something on the antenna, uh, specifically a 313C type vacuum tube, which with its characteristics of that type of tube, given the potential which could accumulate on the flat top antenna, it will be sufficient to activate this tube for some, I would say rather simplistic yet informative experimentation. So that tube has yet to arrive in the mail and once it does then we could go full forward with that analysis on the flat top now in previous calls i have mentioned that the level of radio frequency interference within my present area is of remarkable proportions it does not allow for the reception of these telluric signals as we just saw a clip of recently i'll be using similar equipment such as the 37 bravo as well as some other types of receiving receiving apparatuses to quantify these telluric emissions and signals. But that's still in the future, the near future, because there has to be some equipment and other filtering, which has to be procured in order to facilitate the reception of these signals. Because at the present, the level of interference makes it so that you cannot so simply just place a receiver on the antenna and readily receive these signals. So, so that's what we're stuck with is we cannot receive in the voice frequency band, which is the optimum spot for the so-called earthquake signals. So we're going to go down to the ELF, extremely low frequency band, which is 30 cycles a second down to DC. So what we're concocting is a very unusual radio receiver. There probably is going to be one like it on the planet. And the frequency selected network is basically the gateway to this extreme level of complexity and novelty. So it will go down through the Schumann resonance frequencies down to basically DC. And it should still serve the purpose of, uh, of advanced uh, seismic warning. And Griffin is in an optimum spot to receive seismic warnings and that he's sitting on a giant crack in the ground called the San Gabriel Fault, which borders a massive island of granite called the San Gabriel Mountains, which on the other side of the island is the San Andreas Fault. So, and the ground there is all dielectric. So this um, will quite, uh, quite possibly be a very effective uh, seismic uh, electro seismic precursor facility and all we need is something to happen to indicate that and then we will attempt to go to the the various uh companies and what have you that would be interested in this morning and and make it available to him make it available to them so that's another another big project that's uh that's underway right now Hey, Eric, can you, Eric, can you scoot maybe six inches to your right? That would okay. kind of get your get all well, of you. It's in the kind camera. of hard to get both of us in front okay. of this little camera. So to add on to what Eric has just stated, my current location makes it advantageous for this type of telluric research because living near the San Gabriel Fault and as well as the San Andreas Fault, there there's a series of various transform boundaries, fault boundaries. So this facilitates a very active region, more or less, within the Southern California area. And with my connection with Southern California Gas and Sempra Energy, I will be able to facilitate a seismic warning system with their cooperation within the near future, given the area of California as a whole is a very seismic active region. So they're always proclaiming that the big one is going to hit within the next five years or at any rate, any minute, that is. So I'll be the first one to receive any anomalies which come forth.
So I guess we've covered everything. I think so. I think we can go to questions if there's nothing else to talk well, about. Well, here, um, let's see. Hey, Adrian, long time no see. <laughs> yeah, it's good to see hey, you again. Any any updates on on your end? I have uh, just briefly. I've been involved in a lab move um, in the last two months. Anyone who knows that's tried to move a research lab from one place to another, it's an exceedingly large task of disassembling everything, packing everything, moving it, and then reassembling at the other end. So I have now I've now completed the move, but I'm in the process of setting up the experiments, and setting up the equipment, and getting that all up and up and running again. So I will be back to giving. Um, normal research updates um, on sub on a subsequent live call um, for all the various projects we're currently working on. So that's just a just a brief update where I'm at. Okay. Thanks, Aaron. Yeah. And then uh, let's see, Bruce Gavin. I know he's on the call. Let's see, Mountain Whiskey. Is there anything any update you wanted to share, Bruce? Maybe not. I don't see him in there. There's more to the list. Okay. That we can't, we're not looking at right now. Well, Bruce, if there's anything you want to add, go ahead and just un uh, unmute yourself. Um, so let's see, about an hour, eight minutes into the call. So we made pretty, pretty good time and covered a lot of material. Um, I guess we can go ahead and open up for questions. Um, if anybody has any questions, I can see, um, couple of you had posted in the uh, uh, let's see okay not really any questions in the in the chat so if you have any questions um, there's a reactions uh, option uh, in your zoom control panel and if you click on that there's a little thumbs up and if you click that then um, that'll let me know that you have a question or no no raise hand there's a little thing that says raise hand under the reactions option. So if you have any questions um, and if we can keep the questions kind of brief to the point and relevant, um, then, then we can get through more of them. OK, Mr. Max, go ahead and uh, unmute yourself. You can uh, introduce yourself where you're from, um, who you're asking your question to and then your question. Yeah, it's a general generic type of uh, wondering. Uh, I'm MJ Mueller. I'm in Worcester, Massachusetts. Uh, I've been following White Dragon Press for a long time, getting on these conference calls periodically for the last six months. This uh, I'm an intuitive guy, so this a lot. This technical information is fascinating to me, and it's like an Empire State Building worth a number of stories above my head and comprehension. But I've always been someone that uh, visualized amazingly complex or voluminous content being reduced into kind of a uh, 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 an incremental synopsis type of thing that makes it easier to understand concepts at a smaller and smaller level. And I'm wondering if that isn't something that, you know, could be viewed as a possibility by, by anyone to make it uh, this fascinating material available to the quote unquote lay person and at a, at a speed and a comprehension that they can kind of grok it. That's it. I hope that was short enough. Did you hear me? Yeah, we hear you. Okay. Well, was it Richard Feynman that said, uh, you don't fully understand a topic until you can teach it to a toddler? Uh, it's, a, it's a good point that uh, a lot of the discussions that we have here are relatively high level, and it would be advantageous to have uh, more simple, easy to understand uh, explanations or even a, a more broad summary of some of the projects we're working on. So I, th I think that is a good point. I mean, it's way in the future, but I always say, talk to me like I'm a five-year-old, pretty much mimicking what you just said. So yeah. Well, I would say just to interject, I mean, really to grasp any of this information and this knowledge, it takes time, it takes years, it takes dedication to understand it to a specific level and as far as we as a group are concerned, a lot of this material, specifically Eric's mm -hmm. books and my engineering reports, information produced on websites by Hawkeses and Dr. Marsh, 
are readily available to the public, as well as a multitude of other information on the internet. So it's, I would say it's merely a matter of just finding the time, the inclination and the interest to sit down and patiently learn. It's not necessarily something that could be grasped within, say, a month or so. It takes time. I think that's yep. one of the main factors that a lot of people need to realize. Well, it's um, probably good to keep in mind that we're talking about 30 centuries of human effort behind mm -hmm. this point's time. We're going I would also uh, Pythagoras here, so that's not something you just get in an afternoon. I would also add that so much of this work really is actually quite difficult to describe and talk about because in the end of the day, you have to do it. If you really want to learn about Tesla's processes, the kind of learning that he went through, um, work with those experiments and what it means, at the end of the day, you need to go and make something. Donald Trump has gotten a free pass. Is that well, my thing is that getting to the bottom of the nature of personal and collective reality, and I've been involved in that conversation for well over a decade, so I, I totally get what you're saying. The White House in his inner circle. That he doesn't get I think somebody has a news from... broadcast going on in the background. Yeah, I just paused because I was going to add something. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't want to. Uh, I didn't want to clash with the news broadcast. <laughs> <laughs> but the, the, um, because I mean, at the end of the day, the cutting edge research that we're doing is about is about experimenting. Um, it's it's. There is so much talk about, about Tesla's work and what he did and didn't do and all this kind of thing on the internet um, that at the end of the day, it's, it's very difficult to sift through that um, and get really any objective view about what is really possible and what, what the cutting edge of this research really is. But when you actually start experimenting it, and that's the dedication that Griffin is also talking about, um, years and years of work actually building experiments uh, seeing what they do, things not working, building new experiments. Um, those, that kind of approach is the approach that we're all taking here. And it's unusual to see a group of people working so closely on so many projects that actually have both um, quite significant, quite significant results already, and also the potential to produce groundbreaking. Um, advances as well. There is it's rare to find so many Tesla projects together which have that kind of potential. But that only comes from actually working with it, focusing, and actually doing the experimental work at the end of the day. Thank you. That's why I would add to that. Okay. Uh, let's see. There's a cu couple questions in the chat here or comments, uh, questions. Let's see. Declan is asking. Does anyone have any comments on the seismic activity work that Dutch Inns, I don't know how it's pronounced, but Dutch I-N-S-E is doing on YouTube, if they're familiar with that? And if so, does it impact your understanding of the seismic work you're doing? I haven't heard of it myself. Okay. Anybody else? Okay. Uh, let's see. Physx. Uh, what is ne what is needed is an explanational topographical and side view drawing of the land antenna and wave movement. Is there any kind of like overall diagram showing the 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 setup that anybody can that's, see like in a glance? That's a good point. We should work on that. Well, that's what we did in the last reason we did that in the last presentation with all the diagrams and pictures. Okay. Um, which presentation was that? The one we did before, you know, where I drew diagrams of the antennas and showed the poles and discussed what was going on. Oh, you mean on the last live Zoom call? Yeah. Uh, let me, I'm going to bring that up real quick. Do a screen share. Okay, so on YouTube, well, let's say this thing is kind of lagging here. Just give it a second. 
I don't need to play it. I'm just going to show the uh, the title here. Okay, so if you go to YouTube, um, youtube.com, this uh, live Zoom call from, uh, oh, let me pause that. Uh, May 25th, Eric Dollard live Zoom call. This is where, um, this is what Eric is talking about. So if you go to YouTube and you type this into the search bar, uh, you can go through that. This is an advertisement right here. Uh, otherwise, I could kind of skim through it. But in any case, um, 2024-05-25 Eric Dollard live Zoom call, and that'll, that'll show your uh, the diagrams. Yeah, also, there's two presentations. There's the massive one called uh, the Musical Seismograph, which gets into all the intricacies of the frequencies and phases and relationships and what have you, and the types of amplifiers. And then there's the shorter version, uh, electrodynamic seismic forecasting, which is uh, gives a lot of visuals on one of the facilities in the Mojave and, and some of the stuff. And then Justin and I plan, the heat's gonna go away here, for a couple of days is going out and doing kind of a step-by-step -step or pole-by-pole -pole, uh, discussion of what's going up. So that basically, I think what has been asked for is for the most part already been done. And uh, right now with the, lo the load I have of multiple books and all that, I can't, I can't be, you know, producing another book on, on a subject that, uh, yeah, I, I just can't spread out any further. And and at my age and what have you, you know, I, I just don't have the interest in this stuff that I used to have. That's why it's being handed over to the other people you see on the screen. I've already done all this. I'm kind of tired. So right now I'm just teaching other people. Okay. So on emediapress.com, if you go to the search bar at the top right for products and you type in musical seismograph, uh, this presentation will come up and it's really, I don't know, it's probably like five, five presentations in one. Um, at some point, we'd like to break it down and offer each segment in there as, an, you know, a, a shorter presentation, which is kind of cropped out of this whole thing. And then the other presentation Eric has talk, uh, mentioned is electrodynamic seismic forecasting. Um, you can also get the combo right here at a discount. And then until July 20th of this month, there is 30% off all digital downloads. And you can use the coupon code Hot July Special. Just put that into your shopping cart when you get to the coupon area and enter that. And it'll take 30% off of all the uh, uh, any downloads. Well, you can find those all in emediapress.com. Um, let's see. Now, somebody, I just saw a little thing flash up that, that I should point on. There's this whole thing of what frequency the musical note A is supposed to be. The frequency of the musical note A is essentially irrelevant. What's important is that the frequency of the note C be 256 cycles per second. A440 is a meaningless frequency. It's like using 50 cycles instead of 60 cycles. It's something intrinsically stupid yet widespread. Uh, 432 has been adopted as an alternative, which in the original Pythagorean Plato musical scheme does made up to C256, but in the pure harmonic sense of the music, a has to be, just like C has to be 256, A has to be 426 and two-thirds, not 432. So this is the book that I'm working on now, and this is all very, um, very heavily uh, laid out and portrayed in the musical seismograph. Because unless you use the proper frequencies, you will not be able to get a stereo image out of multiple seismic transducers operating together. In other words, if you put three notes into a system and you look at them on an oscilloscope, the image on the oscilloscope cannot move. It has to be a stable pattern. 
If you try to do that with equal temperament, it's just a, jum a jumble. And basically equal temperament is regarded as all the rest of the metric abominations that have been dumped upon us that uh, it's not does it's not right at all. So, but trying to get around that and what have you is, is a puzzle that's never been fully resolved. But then when you go back and, and get into the origins of the scales and all that type of stuff, there are other scales, there's other way to do things and that's a, an avenue for experimentation. Uh, that actually I have planned for here with an analog computer, but I got so many things planned here that at the present rate, I would have to live to be 256 years old to ever enjoy the results of all of it. Okay. Um, there's a comment uh, or a question on a paper you wrote a long time ago, Eric, in 1985, it was the fallacy of conductors. Would you um, edit the paper now with new insights? Or would you just leave leave it as is? No, I would I would mess with that. But one of the things that that Griffin has, if he lives to be 128 years old, to transcribe all my material, uh, basically what I have done is all the important engineering tech, some of which are no longer available, and the copies are illegible, is. The works of Kennelly, the works of Steinmetz, the works of Fortescue, all these people was never finished. So what I've done is I've gone back and there's one Steinmetz chapter that involves the skin effect. And, um, and Steinmetz usually does a pretty good job of making it clear what's going on, but to try to ascertain what coordinates he's using and how he went about it from the book is virtually impossible. Struggled with it for 20 years. At any rate, I figured it all out. And that would be, you might say, that would be the next chapter in that subject if uh, if we can ever get around to, to transcribing that amongst all the other stuff that needs to be done. Basically, I could have somebody transcribing all, all the stuff I've produced working over a period of every day for three months. So obviously, you know, it's just not, it's just not going to happen because there isn't that financing, there isn't that interest. And unfortunately, what I'm noticing that any valid interest in the works of Nikola Tesla have really just faded away. Now it's mostly just lunacy of things that Tesla never said. And, uh, you know, a history channel crap of space aliens and people who don't know crack from Shinola, what they're talking about, trying to describe stuff and all that. And it's, uh, it's basically any forward movement in the study of Tesla's work and the work of his contemporaries, which is just as important, has basically just blown away in the wind. And now the only thing that the public understands with regard to Tesla is that it's uh, some car that looks like a metal maggot. <laughs> Well, if anybody wants to real Tesla updates on uh, what's going on, this is the call to be on. <laughs> so join Energy Times uh, free newsletter on emediapress.com. Um, and that's where the uh, announcements go out for these calls. Uh, let's see. We have uh, Zenzik with your hand raised. Uh, go ahead and unmute yourself. Um, introduce yourself and uh, go ahead and ask your question. Okay. Hi. Yeah, I've been a, a long time lurker. I've met uh, on the phone with Eric. I was once gonna go up there to help him with some OSP work, but then my life fell apart and had to chase my son to Germany. So I apologize, Eric, for not making it up to help with the efforts back then, but I've returned. So I was studying the pyramids. I noticed that the inches to meter conversion is one over two pi squared as well as the height of the pyramid would have been a ratio of the, squ the square root of three if you could use inches for height and meters for length. That's enough to be said for now. You could view my website, zenzikzenzik.com or Quintilis, the hidden month, quintilisacademy.com for more. I respect you guys immensely. I appreciate all your effort. Thank you so much for leading us here. 
and that's about it for now. Is that cool? Yeah. Okay, thank you. All right. Glad to see you well. Thank you. Any comment on the pyramid stuff, Eric? Not really. All right. Um, let's see. Anybody else have any questions? Um, go ahead and hit the uh, reactions option in your Zoom control panel and hit the raise hand. And then uh, I'm going to mute, mute you out and get your questions uh, answered. I see. Uh, let's see. Okay. Mike S. Yeah, go ahead and introduce yourself, where you're from, and go, go ahead and ask your question. Hey, uh, Eric, uh, and, and everybody, thanks for making this possible, and uh, I really appreciate you doing it. My name is Mike. I'm from uh, New York City, Queens. Um, I just had a question about uh, the uh, RPX that you guys have. Do you have any advice on how to, uh, I don't know, increase performance or, or jack performance, like perhaps like take the outputs, put them through an amplifier, add some magnetic fields in the uh, general area? I, you know, I just figured out if there's anything I can do to jack the performance. So I would say, no, um, you don't want to increase the power on any kind of electro device because that you, um, there's risk of RF burns. That's why it's specifically made for that, that kind of low power. Um, I'm actually currently working on a 50 watt machine right now using the RPX as the driver with a higher output driver to drive a 50 watt linear amp. It's basically done. Uh, Paul Babcock and I were working on that right, right, uh, right before he died uh, about a month ago, month a uh, little over a month ago. So uh, I have the new circuit board done. That's being licensed actually by somebody else who's going to be manufacturing it. And we're just going to be providing the the RPX circuit board with that. I, I can't give any other details other than that is going to be a higher power version of that coming out. Uh, as far as hooking it up to antennas or whatever, um, I actually just made, had some of these done. This is a quarter wavelength, uh, 3.1 megahertz, just simple spiral antenna um, being run off the RPX. The, the broadcast is not too strong because it's, you know, um, going to be the same power as what, what's being used with the, uh, what the output is currently, you know, for the electrodes. And that's pretty much all I can say. Um, it's kind of hard to drive an amp off of the RPX as is, just because the output is kind of low. A couple people have done a few experiments with a couple linear amps where they they kind of got it to work, but it's the output driver. Um, basically, it's a MOSFET driver, which is being used as a radio frequency amplifier on the output of the RPX. And unless you have a higher output one, then it's going to be hard, hard to drive an amp. It's never needed to have the output amplified to so-called increased performance because the way John Bedini has it works. And if you use that so-called pump wave, which is that low eight to nine cycle per second uh, square wave that everything is superimposed um, on that, um, that takes any kind of electrode delivery, you know, kind of to the next level. And, um, you know, the, the feedback from everybody's, you know, re research on that device is, I think pretty phenomenal for what it is. And, uh, but the next step would be, I can't say that the tube device is an improvement. In some ways it could be seen as a, uh, uh, you know, cause if you look at Rife's actual writings, he talks about electro delivery as well. A lot of people are fixated on that. It's all about the tubes, but it wasn't. Um, he, he did quite, quite a bit with electrodes and there's a, book a free pdf download i would recommend if you can find it online i think it's on rifevideos.com and it's called the rife machine report and that has more valid information on the real rife research going back to rife and hoyland and and all these people he worked with then pretty much any website online talking about rife and if you look in there at the um especially on the chapter dealing with a skin effect because a skin effect doesn't really apply to this. Um, what most people are going to be applying these kind of devices to, and you can see that a lot of the, the tests are actually showing it's a lot more effective than tube delivery. 
what is called the Rife Machine Report, free free download, and I'd recommend looking at that. And uh, other than that, not not sure what else. Let me uh, yeah. make a point about skin effect. So the parrots uh, sing, but they know not what they sing about. Skin effect, Faraday cage, and make all these attributions. So one of the, the parrot songs is, is the reason why radio frequency doesn't electrocute you is because the skin effect, that's a line of shit. It flows evenly throughout your body because the skin effect of the human body or salt water in general to the frequencies normally encountered, like with the stuff that Aaron's talking about, the depth of penetration is, is several feet. So the skin effect is not what's keeping it out. The reason you don't get electrocuted is once you get above 10 kilocycles, electricity loses its physical attributes and starts to acquire its etheric attributes. So the chemical processes and things that go on with the nerves and the muscles and all that uh, simply don't respond to those frequencies, but you will experience heating because of the power density. And if you get the power turned up too high, then you're going to get avenues of current flowing internally that could cause uh, damage to your biological structure. You do not want to go above certain power level with this stuff. The other drawback of going higher power level with this stuff is you get to a certain level and you're going to get a visit from the FCC and they're going to be very unfriendly. And that unfriendliness can spread throughout the entire process. And then all of a sudden, nobody's allowed to do these things anymore. That's one of the, the big drawbacks of these people jerking off with their big phallic Tesla coils, making giant sparks and all that kind of stuff. So they have no regard for electromagnetic compatibility, what they're doing to their neighbors' electronics and computers, what kind of Air Force uh, call-in frequencies they might be splattering on. And, and traditionally with the human species is when things are good, there's always a batch that screw it up for everybody. It's just a, a law of nature. So you do not want to go above low power with any of this stuff for those various reasons. You got it. Got it. I appreciate that. So here, here's the uh, PDF I'm talking about. Um, and a lot of the stuff in here is actually based on Rife's own writings uh, and other researchers who have been involved with this you know um john bedini uh uh corresponded with qu uh, quite a few people who are mentioned throughout this book but um th this is a really good um compilation and it should answer quite a few of your questions hmm. about what 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 uh how rife was making his frequencies but also the 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 fallacy of the skin effect there's a whole uh chapter on that Hey, thanks so much. I appreciate that. You won't get any trouble out of me with the uh, amplification. Okay. All right. Thanks, Mike. <laughs> okay. Any other questions? Um, we're going on an hour and a half right now. I see you're you're there, Bruce. I don't know if you had any updates you wanted to share with us, or go ahead and unmute yourself and. Yeah, you're still muted out. Okay, we'll try it. We'll try another time. <laughs> uh, let's see. Any other questions from anybody? If not, um, Haka says, Griffin, Adrian, Justin, Eric, Connor. Any final words or we, we can go ahead and wrap it up? And We're pretty much put it all out. Yeah, yep. I'm just saying in um, closing, thanks to everybody who's been participating with us. Thanks to everybody who's been contributing. Thanks to everybody who's on this call. You know, this group of all of us collaborating this was making this happen, making it possible. So thank you. Look forward to some upcoming episodes. I'd, I'd also add uh, a lot of the stuff uh, here, it seemed like we jumped right into it. Uh, there's uh, years of predecessor and uh, earlier uh, episodes, uh, 
posts, YouTube videos, et cetera, that you can find on Aaron and Griffin and uh, Eric's uh, Eric's sites. If you want to follow up more on the path that led to where we are right now. So for people that want to learn the basics, my first presentation that I put together on a high level is on YouTube under the title, I believe, The History and Theory of Electricity. And that uh, that's a pretty broad presentation that tries to keep everything on a basic archetypical level and not get into a bunch of technical details or or what have you. I think that is uh, that's your best bet if you want to get the language down and kind of what things look like and what have you. Also, the uh, beginning part of the presentation of uh, oh, what was that called? Uh, something of Tesla and Alexanderson. Do you remember, Aaron, what the title is? Um. The something systems of of uh, Tesla and Alexanderson. Yeah, let which, me see if I can let me see if I can bring that up here. The extra luminal transmission system. Yeah, uh, yeah. So, Tesla and yeah. So basically, as it is with a lot of these presentations, sometimes the titles don't work out to be what the presentation becomes. So what? Uh, what I had attempted to do here was carry on from that history and theory of the of electricity was to with the Alexanderson thing is to lay all the groundwork so you can understand what exactly what was going on with the stuff that Tesla and Alexanderson were doing to transmit, but it ended up becoming 90% of the presentation. But there's also a lot of uh, a fundamental material in there uh, for the beginner. And also the presentation on the electrical utility system also has a lot of historical and basic fundamental elemental type of information. Now, one thing I want to point out is, is this, when you get involved in this stuff, it's not like reading a novel. There's going to be loads of stuff that you don't understand and um, and you shouldn't let that stop you. If you don't understand something, well, then go on to the next page or what have you. But find out of the presentation or the book, what is it that you do understand and stick with that. Don't get all of a sudden against a brick wall, you know, that you got to go from beginning to end by page by page. And then on, you know, page uh, 67, there's something you understand. And then you shut the book. That's not how you can learn this stuff. It's way it's way too deep for that. You have to uh, you have to kind of pick at it a little bit here, a little bit there, and uh, and as Adrian pointed out, you have to get physical with it. You have to start connecting parts together and fooling with things, or go out in the street and follow the power lines to the substation, or you know try to make friends with the linemen and ask them stuff, or you know maybe you can get into the local radio station or become part of the ham radio club, even though ham radio is pretty much useless for any of this stuff anymore. I don't think you would get anywhere there, but you gotta gotta go out and uh, and beat your own path in this. It's not something that you're just gonna, you know, start at one end and go to the other end, and then it's just all gonna present itself and you're gonna be an expert on the subject, particularly being that 90% of the material that's generally available is completely wrong and misleading and it's, you have the occurrence of somebody trying to teach you something that they don't understand, and they're just repeating the same stuff that the parrot before them said. And I see this on YouTube. There's all these guys from India, and they think they're going to get on there, teach you about polyphase, and they lead you totally astray. And it's best not to even watch that stuff at all. So I, I think that's uh, that's best my word of advice in the trying to, to enter this subject and get anything meaningful out of it. Uh, this here's a question from Casey Courtney. Has anyone tried putting plants in the cosmic induction generator just to see what would happen? Yeah, it's the same thing as putting them in the microwave oven. <laughs> you think so? Um, well, we did, you know, David and I did that in the beginning. Huh? I mean, we knew what was going to happen. You know, there's a lot of steam. And, 
because we're talking about kilowatts. You know, if if you're trying to make a sun and a light bulb, well, you know, the sun and plant life don't mix when they're in the same space. The sun's going to prevail. So, and, and with the cosmic induction generator thing, right now you, Aaron, have really have the only working unit with the columns and all that. And and the holdup now is is not the equipment, even though you know the higher power unit is on the verge of completion. The holdup now is getting someone to make the specialized vacuum tubes. That's the holdup because of the variabilities of gas pressure and types of glass involved, and all of that is uh, you know Griffin's already done extraordinary work in that regard, but. But I think as Griffin pointed out, just to develop the one tube was what, like 80 tries, Griffin? Oh, about 50. 50? 50, yeah. 50 tubes. So, and that was just, you know, for a very simple evacuated tube, but to get to get the uh, the zero one A tube that I'm talking about uh would require a lot of help from somebody that is knowledgeable and and capable in this field, but those people are far and few between. So, so unfortunately, the cosmic light bulb thing is kind of stalled. Uh, one thing I do want to point out is I was in Rife's laboratory when it was in the possession of uh, the gold panner. I forget what his name was. Bullshit artist. Uh, John Crane. Yeah, John Crane. I was there with Tom Brown, uh, because we did a whole, um, together when he acquired Borderland, we had decided that we had to do a major exorcism of all the demons and, you know, and bad voodoo. And and, and it, it was flooded with that. It was really saturated. And we were going to exorcise the thing. And though this was part of my study of the Integratron, and then Tom Brown and I carried it further into the Borderland thing to visit all the places where, there was the remains or people that were still left alive from all these type of things. And I held one of Rife's tubes in my hand. And uh, I've never seen in any of the stuff written by Rife, I've never seen that tube. But I know what he was trying to do. I've seen all the equipment that was there to drive the tube. So Griffin and I have um, preliminarily developed a tube, which we refer to as the 2B45, which is extremely difficult to construct, which would perform the functions of that Rife tube. So this is something that may come out in a year or two and, and provide some interesting results. So there's a lot of other stuff going on in the background here, you know, like the 01A cosmic light bulb and the 2B45, uh, you know, ray tube. And, but you know, for us to do this stuff by ourselves, it's um, it's very difficult to make any real fast forward progress on this. But we need to, we need something like Edison's Menlo Park. We need you know like twenty five people all with their own benches and adequate funding and what have you. And I don't even know in today's society if we could even find people that have that level of intellectual and and inventive capability anymore. But I just wanted to point out that there is this level of what's going on. I see that uh, Bruce Gavin appeared. Can we communicate with him? Um, he was having trouble uh, unmuting okay. unmuting himself. Well, so we one hear thing him. I wanted to point out or ask, I should say, because we're we're getting to the point now, other than there is a severe electromagnetic compatibility problem with trying to transmit high power to Lyric RF here outside the building with it getting into the wiring and all that, because we simply don't have the funding to make the building electromagnetically compatible. But nevertheless, this thing is going to go on the air permanently at some power level with its own FCC ID number. Um, what my question to Bruce is, which can come back at any time, is um, because he's one of the people that we would try to transmit to with this, is the feasibility of him building a transformer to the exact same dimensions as the one that Griffin built. And what would be helpful to us if he can ascertain the primary coil uh, physical 
characteristics such as number of turns, tubing diameter, and spacing from the resonator to get a, uh, a resistive impedance at that frequency of approximately 2,000 kilocycles. So because we don't really have the means to experiment here with that that he has, and then we can duplicate that here and eliminate the toroidal transformer and hopefully come up with a more efficient transmission. And then of course, Griffin has to make another coil also to be carried around for test purposes. And we have to negotiate here for another transmission site before we can arrange this thing to operate at a kilowatt level. And because of the gangrene energy being so severe here, uh, there's no way that we can receive anything here at all. Not even CB radio, not along, uh, you know, picowatt signals at 2,000 kilocycles. So, so the one coil we have here has to be duplicated, one by Griffin and one by Bruce Gavin, you know, as financially and time-wise and what have you possible. That's uh, one thing I wanted to talk about. So to add on to that, the engineering details, which I've outlined in a couple reports that detail the construction of those coils that Eric was describing, those could be found on my website in book form. I have sent those to Bruce Gavin as well as other members, a part of our group. So this information is readily available. So that's the need then is to get this primary coil thing hashed out and uh, and hopefully get a better match to the transmitter because the toroidal coils are, is, uh, they, they don't work effectively as transformers. So we have to find another way around to make this thing more efficient and be able to crank the power up to higher levels without cooking the ferrite core and dealing with the losses and distortion. Okay. That amongst all the rest of it, Electromagnetic compatibility is uh, no fun. If you want the full glory of it, uh, try an aircraft carrier that gets everything all jammed together on the mass and has to operate in the same space and stop it from burning each other out and interfering and what have you. You'll have some real electromagnetic compatibility fun there, I know. So I'll close on that. Okay. Yeah, I do want to mention on the cosmic conduction generator business is that um, with the MWO that we manufacture here, there is a balanced um, oscillation transformer that Eric designed so you can run the unbalanced um, Lukowski multiwave oscillator in a balanced mode, and it does create the neutral zone in a fluorescent tube. Um, it's not powerful enough, and you can't add audio to it like the fuller scale models, but um, any plants in the vicinity of either the unbalanced or the unbalanced or, or the balanced one, uh, whichever way you run it, Lakovsky's unbalanced or with Eric's oscillation transformer in balanced mode, plants all around the um, multi-wave oscillator just go crazy. Uh, Paul Babcock had a um, one of these inside of his shack right outside of his house and all the plant life all around the shack was um doing everything it could to, to get right up to the back of the wall right where that multi-wave oscillator was and a lot of other people have reported the same thing that plants in the vicinity of this goes crazy also i have a friend um up on the peninsula northwest of seattle who has a one acre cannabis farm and he was doing some experiments with the um, MWO and there's a transmitter and a receiver, so-called receiver coil. The transmitter coil is one that has the fat wire on it. I guess you can kind of say that would be like the primary um, out of the back. And then the uh, antenna would be hanging off the front side uh, where the skinny wire is. Well, in this zone right here where this fat wire is, going backwards about maybe 15 to 20 feet, all the plants in that zone were growing like phenomenally big. It, they just like exploded. And so 
we don't really know what that is, but there's some kind of beam coming out the back end of that that literally is going over 15 feet. And any plant life in that zone right there is being influenced by it. And it's it amplifies all of its growth. Um, there's some experiments that I would like to do, and I hope other people who have these multi-wave oscillators would do, is in the balanced mode with the uh, oscillation transformer. Um, in that neutral zone is to basically germinate seeds and start doing those kind of experiments. I mean, that, that's that's why these things are there and quite a few people have these. And so um, if, if I have time to focus on, you know, on those kind of experiments myself, I'd, you know, love to be able to share those results, you know, uh, on the on the website, just to kind of show what what happens, you know, in terms of germination rate, what percent of seeds are germinating compared to without being treated in that neutral zone and, and, and so forth. Uh, but there's a, there's a, there's a lot there, you know, with electricity and plants in general, but I just wanted to throw that in. Yeah. So in a certain sense, uh, the MWO is a, is a low power cosmic induction generator. That's why you get the neutral zone in between the two coils. I would say the average power is probably between 25 and 50 Watts, but, being that it consists of one microsecond pulses, the peak power is half a million watts. So it's, it lasts for such a brief period of time, like a radar pulse, that it doesn't really act like a half a million watts. But nevertheless, that is a very considerable flow of power and can have profound effects on things without the associated heating and burning and what have you. So, so I guess that some, when someone asked, you know, what is the relationship with plants and the cosmic induction generator, then in this case, evidently it's quite favorable and it's definitely worthwhile to do more experiments in that regard with seed germination. That's something that would seem to be uh, a no brainer to start with and germinate the seeds and uh, and see what happens. It's not that difficult to do. Right. Okay. Um, anybody have any final questions? I don't know if Mike, Mike has uh, another question or if the hand is just raised from uh, last time. Um, okay. Well, if there's no more questions, I guess we can wrap it up and then, uh, you know, yeah, Mike, go ahead. Hey, if it's okay uh, and you have the time, I was just wondering, it's kind of a simple question. I was just wondering how might, um, in playing with these Tesla coils, um, there's high voltages, et cetera. How, how best to ground myself, being that I'm not like trained traditionally electric electrician? I don't quite understand what you're asking. Well, I'm, I, I was asking like, if I go in, say I, I have a, um, I pulse a I pulse a coil and make a high voltage, you know, and in and, and with the bifiller type coil, perhaps a pancake like 1894, maybe even 1894 coil from Tesla. And uh, you know, how would I prevent it to because you know, I read that people were getting electrocuted by these big machines from Tesla's work, and I would prefer not to get the arc transferred through me and maybe you know something I don't know. And so I'd appreciate if you have any insight on that, you know. Yeah, don't connect it to yourself. <laughs> don't uh right. deal with it as deadly because e even though that the impulses themselves might be harmless the uh the machine frequencies or dc involved in generating those are absolutely lethal and the uh, right. impulses pave a path for the the low frequency and dc stuff and make it twice as deadly as it was by itself because it will burn through you and make a path for the dc to follow so do not uh, always deal with that stuff. It's deadly. And, um, and when I was my laboratory, when I was a kid, I had a one inch thick rubber mat on the floor, which uh, saved my life once. And uh, I would recommend, you know, if, if you're just fooling around with this stuff and you don't know the difference between, you know, the power supply part and the impulse part and all that type of stuff, and there's a risk of them being connected together. Don't make physical contact with it. And uh, if you're going to be fooling around with fluorescent lamps and stuff and trying to draw arcs off it, make sure that you have a very thick insulated mat. 
Got it. Thank you. I appreciate that. Tesla actually you know, I was... Tesla had special insulating shoes. And when I was a kid, I always uh, pushed my parents when we went to the shoe store was to get the shoes with the thickest soles to help prolong my life. Is, it, it, is there any merit to attaching something to say your skin and then having a metal connection to say, I don't know, a big object or the physical ground? Is there any merit to that? So that will make you an even. That will make you an even better conductor. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> okay. You then you're part of the circuit. <laughs> yeah. Then you really make yourself. Then you'll really get a wallop because it will want to go to you. <laughs> That's <laughs> why I'm asking you guys. You really I think. I think it's yeah, really. So. It's a really important, Eric. Really, just to underline what Eric has said. I mean, if you are not sure about any part of the system, then don't come into contact with it because you only get one chance. I mean, this stuff will just kill you straight out. Big dielectric. So, Stand on a big dielectric. Yeah. Uh, even that, even that has its dangers. So, um, so really, I would, as Eric said, proceed with great caution. Um, yeah. Or yep. at least have somebody around that has experience with them. They know right. what they're doing with that kind of equipment. Okay, and then I was also kind of curious about um, patent uh, patent four hundred six nine six eight. If you had any advice on uh, on that, I was just looking at you know I've been going through Tesla's patents and I, that one caught my eye. It... No, I, I don't have memorized by number. You yeah. What's have... the title? What's the title of that patent? It, it, it's just a dynamo electric machine, and and um, he uses it. It's based on uh, Faraday's homopolar uh, unipolar generator. And, uh, you know, I was just seeing if you ever played with that patent, maybe. No, I'm not much interested in that high current, low voltage DC stuff. So, right. Mostly radar and radio and, you know, carrier telephone, that kind of stuff. Right. Thanks a lot. You know, I've been reading your books and I just haven't read them enough that I have good intelligent questions to ask you. I keep getting distracted by Maxwell and Steinmetz. So, you know, and, 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 and other ones that you've mentioned. So, you know, thank you again. I appreciate everything you're doing. You're welcome. Yeah. And go, I would recommend going on to um, Eric's website, ericpdollar.com. And uh, let's see, I'm looking for a link here. Let me share the screen real quick. Okay. Okay, so on ericpdollar.com um, forward slash donate, this is where everybody can um, support support the efforts uh, with you know a lot of the experiments and progress that you've seen earlier in this call. But on the main menu bar, it says free, and if you mouse down to uh, videos, then there's all these videos right here. And if you watch all these. Um, this is a lot of the, the work Eric's done over the years, and that, that'll give a lot of food for thought. Um, one question that I was wondering is, you know, with this te Tesla uh, coil experiments people are interested in, you know, um, probably start with something flea power, you know, not these big dangerous systems, you know, like what Eric and Adrian and and some of us are working with. Um, Haka says, you did that one presentation, how to build a Tesla coil the way Tesla did, or is yeah, that, that was a that was a Tesla it? coil with uh, no primary and no secondary, and uh, what was uh, we were lighting a bulb at three feet with a third of a watt. So if you want to go the other way with the very safe methods, there's uh, there's ways to learn about it. So th in that presentation, that's a low enough power way that would be fairly safe for the average person, right? Yeah, I don't see a whole lot of people electrocuting themselves with a function generator. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, and, and actually, you get surprising results with very low power if you do this stuff right. These things that shit sparks all over the place uh, ultimately are not really Tesla transformers <laughs> because they're so burdened with that giant capacitance on the top that basically all it is is a capacitor in series with the induct with an inductor, and. Um, you know, T Tesla did not really build this stuff to make big sparks. He built this stuff to create electric fields and currents and what have you. You know, it, it's like if, if I'm going to build a substation to power a town, 
Well, the thing is, you're going to be shooting giant flames into the sky all night while it operates, because then there wouldn't be any power left for the town. So this whole popularization of, you know, phallic big spark generators and my spark is bigger than your spark and all that. And, uh, and in a certain sense, it's good that it makes a spark because what that does is that shorts it out because if they ever turned that thing on and it didn't make sparks, they would wipe out ele every electronic device within a mile of their residence and then they'd really be in trouble. So there is a certain amount of self-protection, thank God. Okay. Well, we're on uh, two hours here. I think we got to get it get it wrapped up here. Um, out of somebody's comments, I just want to do one one final one. Uh, Adrian, what are there any updated plans on the transatlantic transmission, which has been discussed in the uh, previous calls? Well, or the goal? well, um, in in late twenty twenty two. We did some trials um, between myself, Griffin, and Haxus. Um Unsuccessful trials, but we were we were also under difficult circumstances in relation to the mismatch of the type of equipment that we had, and the the coils, and the and the uh, general conditions on both sides. So there, it lied dormant for a while until we developed um, more consistent and more. Uh, knowledge about how to best use these systems. And I think the most recent time this project came up again was um, in the discussion with Bruce Gavin. Um, there was an idea to that he would build two um, very similar or um, essentially equal um, coils, um, which we could then use on, on both sides of the Atlantic as he's well positioned um, and I'm well positioned. Actually, much better those um, say, for example, where than where Griffin and Hackersis are positioned, and we would see then we, we we would run those trials again. We would both make sure that we have the appropriate ground node. We need a very good ground node um, for this, um, and then proceed from there. Um, that's the current plan. I don't know. Bruce is not able to comment. I think on this call, so perhaps that would be something that we could also add in the. Subsequent call, um, Aaron, just to just to have an update on on those plans for those for those coils. Sure. Again, it it, it kind of proceeds according to time. Um, we all have multiple projects um, on our on our on our hands, but it would be interesting to see. I mean, there is the potential of being able to do it. Um, Eric, we discussed this a, a, a bit in the last EPD Labs internal technical meet. Do you have any further comments on it or? Well, I can't see any reason why you two shouldn't be able to make, you know, some type Indeed. of signal contact with the geography and all of that involved. But like any of this stuff, it's probably going to take some fooling around to get the right, you know, amount of capacitance and all of those things. Because yes. you know, as I've already pointed out, you know, it's there. there is no direct engineering formulation on these transformers. So, you know, you cannot determine its characteristic impedance and, and all of these things. So you can't just mathematically compute what you're going to do. You have to experiment because you have to get that right balance between the high side and the low side of the coil that those two impedances, the product of them, equals the square of the impedance of the coil, and you can't measure any of those things. So you see what I'm getting at? Yeah, indeed. So you, indeed. you can't just say, oh, that doesn't work. Because <laughs> it's nature, as Cecil said something about nature doesn't reveal her secrets so easily. Absolutely. <laughs> well, if, if, if it did, then it would all be done already. So, so, yeah. so we can be pleased that there's still things to research because then there's a lot to find out which is still hidden. Yeah, and there's a protective level too. Indeed. Indeed. <laughs> let's just say, let's just say there would need to be a general raising of awareness in order for yeah. some of those things to uh, to unfold. Well, but that's that's actually we don't look like we're doing too well. So at the that's moment, an, that's an important and left out part that's no longer acknowledged. Indeed, you know, I can't. You know, and the few people that I communicate with this subject, you know, they 
They, there's no way they can comprehend why I'm so deep in the Pythagoras and how I get so many results out of it when they regard that as some kind of Stone Age mysticism, you know, and what have you. Well, there's uh, there's other powers and there's other forces involved that don't necessarily require complexity. They require a certain level of accuracy. Indeed, I agree. It's also and important for us to realize awareness. we are not top of the food chain. You have to be your, you know, your, how would you say, for the lack of a better term, your spiritual makeup has to be kind of in tune with what you're doing. And that is definitely a lacking element in this society. For sure. I agree fully. The transition period was about the time of Kepler. And that's when the other side started to become lost. And it was an imbalance because of the church, you know, forcing everything on society and what have you. Uh, instigated an imbalance that caused a reaction, which now has caused an opposite imbalance. So how do we pull things back to center scale, you know, when first the meter's pinned to the right and then it's pinned to the left? Look, we have to work on the basis that's, that we are gradually working towards this raising of awareness, um, but it does look like things are going to get, uh, things are going to get worse before they get better, I must say. Oh yeah, <laughs> where things, well, things the roller coaster currently are. now is you know it's just at the peak and there's that long downhill stretch. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> but nature always wins in the end. Of course, but that is really the one life. That is the balance of the one life. Okay, well I'm QRU. Okay, we'll see everybody on the. Uh... Next call, um, I don't know, three, four weeks from now, we'll, we'll announce whatever date. Um, that'll be around August 3rd, so something like that. But anyway, we'll get it figured out, and we'll, we'll put an announcement out when the next call is and uh, go from there. Um, thanks for all the slideshows, all the updates. Everybody on the call, thanks for joining, and uh, we'll see you next time. Have a good weekend. All right. Thank you, Aaron. Okay. Been a pleasure. Okay. Bye, Bye, guys. Bye, guys.